This is the screencast for the interconnected section. Here we see the units covered throughout the year on the left and to the right, the units from the 70s and beyond, where we will take a day or two addressing the global issues that occurred from the 1970s to present day. You want to make sure that you are familiar with the terms, utilizing this particular sheet, determining the decade from, and then writing a summary or a definition. If by any chance you are choosing to use AI to copy and paste the terms, then I guess that is on you, but keep in mind that would be a perfect example of Frederick Taylor's reduction of skill and do not complain in the future when there are no jobs and the economy has gone down as a result of no jobs being available. Anyway, let's move down here to NAFTA. The first term up is NAFTA. NAFTA is a trade agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And it pretty much loosens restrictions. If you were to complete this link, it talks about how goods being able to travel from Mexico to the United States and Canada. And those goods uh, definitely are uh, not going to be charge any sort of tariff. A tariff is when you charge a certain amount of money to import goods from one country to another. And that is a way to protect the, the uh, businesses within your own country. So NAFTA is going to do two things that we're concerned about here. Number one is it's going to lead to a reduction of wages, which we'll see in the next slide. It's uh, also going to lead to a trade uh, a trade uh, increase between these three countries here, and that's designed to compete with other comparable organizations like the EU. And uh, in the video, it talks about how Ford is sending jobs to Mexico. And I use this example here. If you were building Ford cars in the 1980s, you could receive a 25 hour uh, pay raise or pay. And then if you worked a 10 hour overtime, that would be an additional 375. I took that 1375 multiplied by 52 weeks, gave us a salary of this. Then I compared that to 2023, and that would be the equivalent to this amount of money, which is not bad considering you could achieve this amount of money without a high school diploma. The lesson here is you're probably going to need some sort of skill. I don't know if college is going to help, but you're definitely going to need something in order to be competitive and be able to command this particular salary. Another thing that the video addresses is immigration and uh, although NAFTA is taking place in the 1990s it does impact immigration from the southern border and uh, just jumping to the two, uh, 2020s when we have uh, COVID and the pandemic the Trump administration implemented Title 42 which basically said for example this guy right here cannot enter the United States because he may possibly have COVID and uh, once Biden became president, it created this debate in the country about immigration. There were some cities that became what's uh, known as a sanctuary city, which pretty much meant if you went from Mexico to one of these sanctuary cities, they would not deport you, or send you back. And uh, this started this debate because in the United States, some countries on the southern border, like Arizona and Texas, they want the federal government to do something about immigration on their border. And again, not that this is a direct connection to NAFTA, but NAFTA is just another example of some of the policies that impact immigration. And um, it's just, a, you know, another piece of the puzzle, like the Bracero program or the 1929 Mexican Repatriation Act. Another term on the sheet is Inconvenient Truth, which is actually a film. Al Gore, the vice president of the United States and a presidential candidate in the 1990s, uh, really went behind this particular film and uh, promoted this heavily. And uh, I would say if before this film came out, the uh, argument and understanding of global warming just did not exist unless you were a scientist, somebody political, somebody really interested in the topic. But when this film came out, what it did was it, you know, made that debate known to, you know, the majority of Americans because it was heavily, you know, uh, promoted. Now we're back to the internet from the 1950s the 1969 ARPANET with this schematic outlining how you can link one computer with another. By the time we get to the 70s, the ARPANET has been expanded to have more network computers within the network that can communicate. And eventually this would lead to the evolution of the internet. If you were to click this link here, it would take you to a video explaining how that would potentially happen. And um, 
as far as home computers go, you know, uh, this is a video game called Pong. And a lot of video game consoles like the Atari and Television and ColecoVision, you know, there were some others that came out like the Commodore 64. In the early 80s, you know, the uh, use of a computer was pretty much limited. And you really didn't know what this was going to be used for. And it was kind of ridiculous to try to market this to Americans where they really couldn't do anything. For example, I would say like if you were saving recipes, you would save the recipe on this tape. And let's just say you were in the kitchen trying to cook. You could be female, you could be male, and you're cooking, I don't know, let's say toast. For some reason, you need the recipe because you don't forgot. Maybe you were smoking too much crack. Maybe that's what wound up happening. I don't know. But anyway, um, you could easily just write this toast recipe on a piece of paper, put it in the drawer. Or you can load up your Atari 800, put your tape in, and then you can wait for that thing to load up probably going to take you about five to ten minutes in comparison to just being able to go into your drawer. And my point here is that computer technology for the home in the early 1980s, nobody quite knows what this is used for. You really need to have some sort of technical skill set. So here we see some ma a manual for the Atari 800. It'll get into some of the specifics of that particular system. Another way you were able to save basically text with using a word processor, which is pretty much a typewriter, but this is all inclusive. You have a printer. You have a, a disk drive here where you could save, and all you could pretty much do is type. It's sort of like using Google Docs or Microsoft Word. And again, like nobody really knows where this computer technology is going to go. And that's where Steve Wozniak and Ronald Wayne come in, where they're starting to build their first Apple computer. And the one thing they're able to do is make this computer, I'll say, user friendly for the masses. If in life you could figure out a way to provide something for the masses, that's usually when you are going to be successful. You could think about Henry Ford and his Model T, bringing it down to $300, and that's really when he starts to make some cash. But it has to be user friendly, and that's what these two individuals wind up doing. Uh, that really starts, if you were to click this link here, look at 1984 and the um, Apple promotion at the Super Bowl claiming that 1984 was going to be different because their MacBook was, their Macintosh was coming out and that was going to be a defining moment in history. Now that starts off the debate between uh, Mac or Apple and uh, PCs. And I'll just talk to you a little bit here about this company called Gateway. They would sell computers. And what Microsoft was able to do is they were able to get computers from the factory loaded up with their software represented by these little dots right here. And again, like when, a, when people don't really know what these computers are going to be used for, this software definitely becomes crucial to being able to sell this to the masses. Otherwise, what the hell is the point of having this computer? What are you going to do with it? And that's what Microsoft was able to do, make this software, make it user friendly. But their problem was, I guess really not a problem, their software was preloaded into computers, which led to a debate about whether or not it was a monopoly. Because most uh, Americans in the 90s, 80s, 90s, they're using the PC, and that led to this particular um, court case here where they're trying to claim that Microsoft was a monopoly primarily because all of their software were loaded up to these computers prior to those computers being sold. Uh, Yahoo was a uh, search engine. Here we can see what that acronym stands for. And this is, you know, in the 90s when computer technology is about to take off again. Nobody really knows where this is going to go. And it pretty much looked like a Reddit message board where you can look up various topics. This now we're transitioning to cars. We remember we talked in the 1950s about the four cylinder engine in the 20s and how in the 50s they made it those eight cylinder engines, which were bigger, commanded more fuel. And uh, here we see some of those bigger cars in the 1960s with those eight cylinder engines, those gas engines. And in the 1970s, there was a gas crisis prompted by an organization called OPEC, as well as environmentalists claiming about pollution, as they usually do. They complain about pollution. And these issues led to the gas crisis in the United States in the 1970s, which forced American manufacturers to make smaller cars. The problem was American manufacturers were not good at making those four cylinder engines. Here we could see a Ford Pinto. Here we could see a Pacer. And these cars were just terrible. For example, this one had the gas tank in the back. And if you were to rear end it, it would explode. If you want to see what that looks like, take a look at this video right here. Another uh, incident taking place in the 1980s was the Challenger explosion. The United States had already won the space race out doing the uh, Soviets in space exploration, and investment into space exploration was on a decline in the 1980s, which led to the Challenger 
or not uh, the decision to place a teacher on the space shuttle and have her go into outer space and teach a lesson. That was the plan. She was going to go to outer space from Earth to, you know, give a lesson. Well, if you watch this video clip, it didn't go so well. You'll see the space shuttle in the air, and then it kind of explodes and goes into this kind of Y pattern. It's a total disaster. We already talked about Chernobyl. Chernobyl was in the Ukraine, and this was a nuclear power plant. And uh, there's two in the United States, or one in the United States, two uh, combined. Three Mile Island, which took place in the 70s, and then the Chernobyl incident in the 80s. And the combined impact of these two is that there was less support for any sort of nuclear power plant reactors being built. If you were wondering in the 1980s, were cell phones available? They definitely were. They were large. Sometimes these things actually had a backpack that you could have. You would go to the store and you would see somebody walking around with a backpack, talk into a phone because that backpack had the battery. This is what you would call a beeper. If you were going to text somebody, you actually, if you're using this Motorola here, you would call the person's number and then you would tell the operator, hey, tell Bill that I am no longer interested in dating him and that he sucks. And then the operator would take your message type it and then send it to Bill and then Bill would get really upset and then who knows what that individual is going to do. In the 1990s, again, if people were unsure of what computer technology was going to do, the idea of selling goods online seemed definitely foreign. You started to see companies like Amazon uh, coming out, a bunch of pet company stores, bookstores, and what they were trying to do in the 1990s convince people that, you know what, we could stay home and order stuff online and it would just show up. And that led to what becomes known as a dot-com bubble, where a lot of people just invested into um, internet companies, and some of them were successful and some of them were not. This slide, we're looking at the clone sheet. You know, there's a Molly, Dolly, Polly. One of them's the first. I don't even remember which one. It might be Molly, um, whatever. But this starts to debate about whether or not human science uh, has gone too far because now we're starting to clone animals. And what's next? Humans are gonna start cloning humans. And before you know it, there's going to be a race of cloned humans complaining about their rights, which is going to lead to some sort of clone revolution. And then we cease to exist when we combine that with things like AI. And then there's an all out war between cloned humans, regular humans, and robot, non-humans, whatever. Let's move on to the next task, which is going to be Napster. Cower Records was a company that sold records, CDs, tapes, and it was very popular. And that was up until the point when Napster, when Sean Fanning created a software that allowed you to upload your music into your computer. And then other people from around the world could download this software, Napster, which would allow them to access your files and basically steal music. And that's what's going on here. That's what it would look like. Social activism, if you're wondering what this was about, social activism is about using social media as a way to, you know, advocate for rights. That's why you see a bunch of people on TikTok doing what they do, making their videos of them dancing, because that's the way, of course, you have to promote rights by dancing on TikTok and then trying to get supporters or by putting your Facebook banner or your social media, whatever. In the 1960s, people knew how to protest. Just look up the uh, self-immolation Buddhist monk in Vietnam. Uh, look up, um, well, why is this? And Norman Morrison, the Quaker, set himself fire outside of McNamara's office. Those people knew how to protest. Whatever you want to say about boomers and generations before you, those dudes and dudettes knew what to do as far as protesting is concerned. In the next slide, we see a court case involving Netflix and pretty much what's going on here is that Netflix, once they started to stream their services, they did not put captions, which meant if you could not hear, what were you gonna do? Predict what was going on based on the visuals? This is a court case that pretty much forced Netflix to put copyrights on streaming videos. And here we see representation in mass media. If you were to click these links, you would be confronted with a bunch of sitcoms from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And all I will say is they were not inclusive. And there's a debate about inclusion today in the 2020s. 
about every group having to be represented. And then if you go back into the 1970s, no group was represented, represented, which is why this topic here is representation in mass media. And that's it for 1970s Interconnected. Enjoy.